Uh, today we're going to continue on in part five of this series on grace to you. We began talking about grace and how grace is God's favor and how his favor saves us, justifies us, and also enriches us, blesses us, that we might have everything we need on every occasion, that his empowering presence would be with us to transform us into who he wants us to be so that we can do the things that he wants us to do, that we can receive of his spirit of grace, that we might be a blessing to others, that as we have received his grace, so we give grace. And we've been talking uh, the last couple weeks about the gifts of his grace, the manifestation of his grace, which is found in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And also we've been talking about this concept of tongues and prophecy that's spoken of in 1 Corinthians 14. And I'd like to begin there today. If you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we're just going to pick it up here in the first verses again of 1 Corinthians 14. It says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Now, it's interesting, the word gifts there is there because this chapter is going to talk about gifts, but in the literal sense, it's not there. What it's really talking about is pursue love and desire the spiritual what is it that's spiritual? And I think as we begin today, what I want us to reflect upon is that God is giving us commands here to pursue love, which he said is the better way, the great way, to pursue love and to desire spiritual. That is, to desire life in the spirit, life with God and the spirit that he gives to us as was promised by Jesus Christ. So again, he says, pursue love and desire spiritual, especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. But no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Now, we're going to talk about that today, about edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. Do you think about what you're reading there? Does that just go in one ear or out the other? Or does it, do you absorb that? The Apostle Paul is saying, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but what I really wish is that you all would prophesy. Do you feel that from Paul, but more than that, do you feel that from God, that that's God's desire, that God would have you be able to prophesy. Now, this is a heart that is not just found here in the writings of Paul, but if you'll turn with me back to Numbers 11, this was actually expressed here in the Old Testament with Moses. Turn with me to Numbers 11. You might recall this time that there were 70 elders that were chosen who were going to be helpers to uh, Moses in the work that he had to do. And in verse 16, God said, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. And then I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. Now, this is very interesting in typology because ultimately, when Christ came, he was full of God's grace and full of the Spirit. And he did many marvelous signs and wonders through the work of God's grace. And he said, I do nothing of myself, but as my Father says, that's what I speak. As my Father does, that's what I do. That he was looking to his Father in every way. And then the Spirit comes and he said, it's good, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I go away, I'll pray the Father and he will send the Spirit and the Spirit will come to you, and this is what we're talking about, how this Spirit comes upon those who are believers and those who look to, to Christ. But notice verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the Spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the Spirit rested upon them that they prophesied. They prophesied why? 
because he poured his spirit on them. His spirit on them caused them to prophesy. And it says uh, that they didn't do this again or they'd never done it like this again after that moment in time. And it says in verse 26, but two men, two of the 70, had remained in camp. The name of one was Eldad, the name of the other, Medad. The spirit rested upon them as well. So even though those two of the 70 didn't go out to the tabernacle, uh, there is God's spirit on them. And now they were among those listed but had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. So even though they weren't right there, God put his spirit on them, and they're prophesying in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Mandad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of the choice men answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Don't let this happen. And Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Are you, are you feeling like this shouldn't be happening because I'm not there or they're not with me? Or what, what, are, what are you thinking? Are, are you jealous for me? And notice what Moses said. Oh, that all of the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. I think when we think about this heart that he has and that we read about in 1 Corinthians that Paul was, was inspired to write, we think about, oh, that God's spirit would be on everyone and that all would prophesy. And I just want to ask, is that even your heart as a Christian? Has anybody shown you the word that, that says and expresses these sentiments? Is this even part of your thinking as a Christian? I want us to turn for a moment to... Um, the uh, teachings back in, in uh, uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And notice with me here in John 14, verse 16. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I think these words are so powerful because it, it could be so easy when you have Jesus in the flesh and you're seeing him healing people and, and doing miracles and raising people from the dead and walking on water and feeding the 5,000. You know, the disciples had this shared human experience with, the, with Emmanuel, God in the flesh. And there is the one who was the word from the beginning with them. And, and to desire that in their lives had to just be tremendous. To, to be in that moment and say, we are here with the one who has prophesied to come. We are seeing the reality of the Messiah. And we're seeing the signs. We're seeing the wonders. We're seeing all the works that he's doing. And he's saying, it's good that I leave you. Because if I leave you, I will pray the Father in another comforter. That word another means another of the same kind and type. Some, another one will be sent, and the spirit of truth will do what he says here, that the spirit of truth will be with you. It says, but the world cannot receive the spirit of truth, uh, verse 17, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. In all of the seeking of God's grace, in all of what we do in pursuing love and earnestly desiring spiritual gifts, it must come with a desire for a genuine communion and relationship with the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the communion of the Holy Spirit, you have to ask yourself, do you even see him or know him? How do we receive him and know him? Because we have fellowship. We have heard the testimony of the Holy Spirit and know of the Holy Spirit's coming. And it says here, if you turn over just to John 16, 13, it says, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Do you believe those verses? 
Because if you believe those verses, like I believe those verses, it says that he will tell you things to come. The spirit of prophecy comes with the Holy Spirit. And as the spirit was poured upon the 70 elders, as the spirit is poured upon people throughout the scriptures, there is prophecy. Now, maybe some of you uh, and some of us as a whole, we can feel a little scared of prophecies. We can feel a little scared. But, but here's kind of an interesting thing I think we need to reflect on. When you look at this book, it is largely based on prophecy. In fact, you are here and you are a Christian because you actually believe in prophecies. You believe prophecies were given, that prophecies were fulfilled, and you believe that there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled. If you don't, if you, if, why would Jesus be important? Well, there was these prophecies of the Messiah, and we find those prophecies throughout the scriptures. And if you start looking through the books of the Bible, you're going to be hard-pressed to find many that don't actually have prophecies. Certainly not indirect, but if you think about it, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, there's prophecies in every one of those books. If you're uncomfortable with prophecy, I would ask you to take a step back and realize your holy faith is based upon prophecy. It is a huge part of the scriptures. People estimate there that probably 25 to 30% of what you read is prophetic. Some of those prophecies, a large amount have been fulfilled. Others yet to be fulfilled, like the return of Jesus Christ, him coming with his saints, him ruling and reigning, still to come. But his first coming, him coming as a lamb, him coming to take the sin of the world upon himself, the father being bruised, uh, pleased to bruise him, as it's, as it's written of in Isaiah 53, Talking about Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The whole relationship of God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, all of this prophecy of this one being born. For unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. These are prophecies. We believe these prophecies. And what is so compelling is that God is saying, engage in a relationship with me where I pour my spirit upon you and you also engage in prophecy because the spirit will come and the spirit will tell us things to come. And this is part of a, uh, of a Christian life. It, it is part of the gifts that can come by God's spirit and we're specifically told to be seeking spiritual gifts and especially that we would be able to prophesy. But why? Why would it be important? Why, why is this a thing? Why is it important that there is a gift of prophecy? And why would God tell us to pursue the gift of prophecy? Why would Moses say, I wish that the Spirit was on everybody and everybody prophesied? Why would Paul say, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more than that, I wish that you would all prophesy? Why would this feeling be there in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and Moses and in the, and the apostle of grace, you could say? It's kind of an amazing thing when you look at it that they both have these words in the scriptures for us and putting it out there and saying, isn't this a life? The life in the spirit. Now, what is prophecy? Prophecy is inspired speaking by God. It's like divine inspiration. And it is a foretelling of events to come, but it is also a giving of revelations that, that come that can be spoken to be given to others. Now, I want you to think about the gifts of the Spirit because the gifts of the Spirit are talking about a word of knowledge, right? Something that could be spoken. A word of wisdom, something that could be spoken. It talks about, in Romans, the gift of teaching. It talks about tongues and interpretation of tongues, speaking, communication, and prophecy, things that are spoken, a lot of the gifts of the Spirit are things that are spoken. And it's important to understand that that is how God creates us new. And that is how God transforms us. Just as he said, let there be light, he commands that light. Light in his word is creative. When he speaks, creation happens. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So all of this speaking, all of this teaching, all of these gifts of the Spirit 
are meant to be building up and edifying the church to have understanding. And so we're going to look now at some of the purposes that we can find in the scriptures for prophecy and just talk about why this is important. But ultimately, this is a sharing of the heart and mind that God has. When he gives a prophecy, he's sharing things from his heart and his mind. This is not come by the will of man. This comes by the inspiration of God, by the Holy Spirit making things known that God would like to share with us. So let's take a look at this. The first one we're going to look at is for personal revelation and conviction. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 14, and we're going to pick this up in verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and notice with me, if you would, in verse 24. 1 Corinthians 14, 24. It says this, 1 Corinthians 14, 24, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, that is to the meeting, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So purpose number one, why would God want us to be able to prophesy? So that if an unbeliever comes in and you have the ability to prophesy and to bring about revelation of things that are in their heart or in their mind, that they would believe there is a God. One of the first times I ever had an experience like this, it was about 25 years ago, and I was in a prayer meeting with, with everybody in the meeting was blind, except a person that was a leader in that meeting, but it was a group of people of about 15 blind people in Argentina. And as I was praying for the people that were there, there was a woman that came into that meeting, and I was kind of down. It was a long, narrow room, and I was down here praying, the doors down there, but it was like when that woman came in, it was like somebody turned my head and was like, look there. And when I looked at the woman, I immediately could sense what was going on in her life. I immediately knew something was not right in her heart. And so I continued to pray around the circle, and when I was finished praying for all the people, one of the people that was there who was not blind brought her and said, she really wants you to pray uh, for her. And I said, I will. And as soon as I just kind of raised my hand toward her, I just started telling her what was in her heart. And I don't know, I never had that experience. I didn't ask for that experience, never really knew, but I didn't need to know what to pray because I was telling her what she needed prayer for. And I started telling her things and she was just looking up at me and tears just started streaming down her face. And I was telling her of what she needed from God, what God had sent her there for. And she was under a, a crippling curse of not believing in the power that God has to save, to redeem, also giving her incredibly low self-image. She could not see herself as holy and accepted in the blood. She had such a magnifying glass on her sin, she could not see the gospel in herself. And God just gave me the words that spoke to her in that moment. And then I prayed for her to be delivered and released, and she completely came undone before the Lord, completely fell down, and completely was just giving herself to God and, and giving praise to, to him. And so... I continued to fellowship and pray for some people, but she collected herself, and 15, 20 minutes later, she came up to me, and she couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak Spanish, but um, a translator was there, and she said, I've been in this ministry for a long time, and I wasn't going to come here tonight, and she said, because what do I have to offer anybody, and, and she said that she was crying out to God, like, you know, what am I to do and why am I alive? And she was feeling so empty. And she knew what the reason was. And obviously God knew. And she said, God spoke to her, you go to the church now. There's a man of God there waiting and he will pray for you and you will be delivered from this. And the reality is she, she was faithful to come. And I was just like a puppet. I was just... I was just somebody used. There was nothing, there is nothing special about me or different than any person in this room. It was just a moment in time where God decided to do something and it happened. 
And the, the testimony is that God can do what he wants when he wants. But he does tell us that we should be pursuing love and that we should be seeking spiritual gifts so that we can be available when the time comes to set not our mind on the things of this world, but on the spiritual. And that's why I was pointing out at the beginning of in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, he says, pursue love and seek the spiritual. Seek to have a life with God. It is so easy to say we accept Christ, we accept the gospel message, we accept this, and not actually engage in a spiritual walk. We can get so involved in our jobs, in the world, in all the lust of it. And believe me, the world is designed to keep you from walking in the spiritual. The world doesn't want you on your knees. The world doesn't want you fasting. The world doesn't want you giving up your life in the world to go after God. The whole world is designed to keep you from God. But if you will pursue love, if you will earnestly desire and seek spiritual gifts, there is a walk with God in the spirit that can transform. Because what happens is your life now doesn't remain your own. Your life becomes lost in Christ. And Jesus himself said, unless you are willing to take up your cross daily and follow me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Jesus said, he who would seek to save his life will lose it. He who will lose his life for my sake, he'll find it. The life that God wants us to have is a life of devotion to him. And it is much more than going through the motions, the motions of Christianity or going through the motions of doctrinal exercises or theology and knowledge without a reality of relationship. If you are living your life without a reality of the Holy Spirit's engagement in your life, let this be the day that you see what the scriptures say, that there is a desire that should be within us for more of God. Better is a day in your courts than a thousand other days. Better is a life spent pursuing God than a life apart from him. Do we want the reality of God in our lives? Do we want him to be engaged? And my answer is yes. My encouragement to you is to say, yes, Lord, yes. Who can I send? Raise your hand. Say, send me. Send me. I want to be engaged, Lord. So conviction is one of the most powerful things. Okay, let's go to the next one here, which is found in uh, Exodus chapter 3. The next purpose, second purpose we're going to look at is to reveal God's will and plan. Notice with me in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. In verse 7, Exodus 3, let's pick it up in here in verse 7. So this is when Moses saw the burning bush. He goes before the Lord. The Lord says, take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. And he draws near to God. And God says in verse 7, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now, I just want you to see that because you got to love this about God, right? He sees the sorrows of people. And he is calling Moses now to, to, to go after the people. And so in verse 8, he says, So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold... The cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Awesome prophecy, isn't it? One of the most beautiful stories in all of Scripture, God hearing the cry of his people, God going, but he sent a person to go, and he prophesies that he is going to deliver them out of Egypt where they have been held for slaves and have been slaves for 400 years. He's going to bring them out of that slavery. Now, Moses, when he hears that, what does he say in verse 11? Who am I? Who am I?
you don't have to feel any pressure to do a spiritual gift, to express a spiritual gift, or to have a manifestation of God's grace in your life. Do you know how the manifestations come? Because God is in your life and things happen. You have words of knowledge or words of wisdom. You have gifts of teaching or gifts of administration. You have the gift of leadership. You have the gift of giving. God gives gifts that are manifesting the the reality that God is in your life, that God has poured out his grace upon you. You don't have to make it up. It can just come. It can just happen. Just as much as the Spirit was poured on the 70 elders and they began to prophesy, that happens numerous times. Throughout the scriptures, we see when God's spirit comes upon people, they speak, thus says the Lord, or here is the testimony. It's estimated there is somewhere between 1,800 to 2,500 specific, clearly spoken prophecies in the Bible. Like just where things are spoken, God speaks, God blesses, and he does it as he wills and as he wishes. God does amazing things. So Moses is saying, who am I? How am I going to do this thing? And the answer is, it's not up to you, man. This isn't about you. So God, when he, when Abraham, or excuse me, when Moses says, who am I that I should go? Down in verse 14, what does God say? I am who I am. You're worried about who am I? I'm telling you, God's telling him, I am who I am. You don't need to worry about it. Remember in 1 Corinthians 15, we read that Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I labored more abundantly than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. It's by God's grace that Paul became who he became, that he suffered many things, that he took the gospel throughout the Gentile nations, that he taught people and brought many. Do you realize that God called Paul, who was killing and persecuting and imprisoning Christians to write a lot of the New Testament that speaks to us profoundly today of what it is to come to the realization and the revelation of Jesus Christ and have our whole lives turned upside down. And his whole life was turned upside down. And he prophesied, and he spoke in tongues, and he gave interpretation of tongues, and he gave all kinds of manner of gifts, whatever was needed. He saw people with demons, he cast demons out. He raised from the dead. He did amazing, marvelous works, yet not him, but the grace of God that was in him. It is the same for you and me to realize that seeking spiritual gifts is not about us trying to do something. If somebody's trying to tell you, hey, start speaking in tongues, let me teach you how to do it, I say reject it out of hand right away. Because if they're trying to teach you to do it, you got to say, well, then is this a spiritual gift or is this a man-made gift? Because we can all speak in other sounds that are unintelligible of our own carnality. The genuine gifts of prophecy, of speaking in tongues, of words of knowledge, of words of wisdom, they come by God's grace. They come because he says, here you go. And you have it for the moment. Most of the prophecies I've experienced in my lifetime actually happened not when I was seeking for prophecy, not when I was even thinking about prophecy. I was thinking wholeheartedly on God. I was worshiping him, and a revelation would come. Worshiping. One of the very distinct prophecies I got when God was really starting to call me into ministry 25 years ago, I was in my car. I was driving to Detroit. Like of all the destinations to go to, right, to get... A prophecy, but there I am in my car. I've got the worship music on. I'm praying. I'm praising because I've got this uh, five-hour drive from from where I lived in Illinois over to Detroit, and just like that, not expecting it, God puts right in my heart. You're going to receive an offer on your house. It's going to come in tomorrow, and He gives me down to the exact minute of when I was going to receive it, and that would be the offer because we were in prayer about selling our house, we were getting ready to come to California. And just as he said, got the call the next, I told Stephanie, she's like, okay. I, the next morning, we got a call from the agent and the, we were gonna get an offer on the house. Cool. 
we're going to get an offer. But the agent said she would be to the house a lot earlier than the time that God had given me because it was down to the precise minute. And Stephanie's like, well, we're not going to wait, you know, for that minute to come. If she gets here early, we're going to get the offer. But as it would be, she got the offer. She came to the house, the agent did, and she was late. And when she got there, she said, the offer's here. I haven't even had time to open it yet. Her and Stephanie sit down, and they open the envelope, and Stephanie said, David, it's such and such a time. I'd quote you the time because I, 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 I didn't look it up before I came. I don't want to misquote the minute. But, the, but it was to the very minute that I said we would get an offer on the house. What do you think that did for me? What, it increased my faith a lot because I knew that God knew who I was. I knew that God knew we were thinking of moving. I knew that God knew what this plan was for our life. I knew that God was engaged, and I knew that God wanted us to tell us something to say, keep going. Don't stop. Keep seeking time with me. Keep worshiping me. Keep having this life with me. It became so clearly evident that God was engaged in life. And what better thing is there than God being engaged in your life? It's not about having that moment. It's about what that moment means in relationship with God. It's not about an experience. It's about him. When I am that I am takes a hand in your life. You hear me say a lot, let God be God. I don't want this church being here if, if, if it's not of God. I don't want to be engaged in going through motions and not having the reality of God. And it is, it is my job as a shepherd in, in, under Jesus Christ in the church to say, go for more relationship with him. Seek him in prayer. Seek him in fasting. Seek to have a relationship with him. And make sacrifices of some of the things you enjoy most about this world to spend more time with him. It's so easy, right, to get so caught up in the world and in the things of the world. We can get so caught up in our business. We can get so caught up in our entertainments and our pleasures. Life in its deep love form requires sacrifice, whether in your relationship with God or with your spouse or with your children or with your friends, it is making sacrifices for others in relationship. How much do you love and care for God? How much do you treasure the invitation to the relationship? See, that's really what this is about. It's not specifically as much about prophecy or other gifts of the spirit of healing or working of miracles. Those things come from that relationship. I'm not here to say just seek the things that are really cool that God does. What I'm here to say is seek a relationship with him. Seek his holy face. Seek to sit before him. Seek to hear from him. Seek to receive revelation. Seek to receive whatever he wants to give you. For the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. That's what we read a couple weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 12. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. To some, a word of knowledge. To some, a word of wisdom. And so on and so forth. Be engaged that you might be enriched for those occasions. So grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ that you would receive of his grace that you might have grace to minister to someone else. You have been called to be one of Christ's at his coming, and you have been called to be one of his disciples, to engage in the business, in the load of sharing his spirit and his spiritual gifts with others. All right, let's look at the next one here. To validate God's existence and his word. Turn with me over to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. In 1 Kings chapter 18, it tells the story of Elijah. 
Um, Stephanie and I had the chance when we went to Israel this last year to actually go to this mountain and to look upon the, the whole valley there and just realize how awesome it was. And uh, what was really cool is as we came to this mountain where Elijah was meeting with these prophets of Baal to have this face-off, if you look right across the valley, you're looking right at Nazareth. And it always makes me wonder, Jesus, did you want to see this place where you confirmed your word through the prophet of Elijah because he demonstrates his dominance over any other god with this And so let's pick it up here, Uh, just a little refresher. You can read it on your own later. But in verse 21, 1 Kings 18, 21, and Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? And we don't use that word falter, but like it's basically you're waffling back and forth. You want God, you don't want God. You want God, you don't want God. You want Baal, you want God. Who, Who do you really want? Why do you keep going back and forth between the gods of the world And the true God. And that is, again, what we're talking about here. Having a relationship and devotion to God that throws out the things of the world as useless in comparison and and relegates them to where they need to be under your relationship with God. Notice he says, if the Lord is God, Yahweh is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bowls. Let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods. I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, it's well spoken right? It's like, bring it on, right? It's like, you feel like you're going to the big fight, the big test. Here's, here's what it's going to be. So they call out, and basically Elijah says, where's your God? He must be sleeping. Is he in the bathroom? Where is he? We can't be found. Nobody's answering you. And then what does Elijah do? He starts having water poured all over his sacrifice. He fills a whole trench of water around the altar where, where his is cut, and he then comes and approaches God. Notice down in verse 36. So it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. So God had prophesied to Elijah This wasn't Elijah's idea. This is God's idea. Let's go make a show. And that's why I'm kind of like, maybe that's why Jesus liked the view. Like, that's where it happened. You can look even when he was in the form of flesh. That's where it happened. He said that I have done all these things at your word. Verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are Yahweh God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Beautiful thing. God confirmed his existence. God confirmed who he was and he validated that to all the people that they would see and know. Let's turn over to um, first, uh, first Samuel chapter 10 now, and we're going to look at number four here, and that is to foretell future events. So you might remember in First Samuel chapter 10, this is where the timing has come now. The people had rejected, as it's recorded in, in First Samuel 8, they had rejected God from being king. Saul was now being chosen per the knowledge of God. God told Samuel, that's the person. You're going to be anointing him king. But I want you to notice what happens here in chapter 10. So in 1 Samuel chapter 10, it says in verse 1 that Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head, that is on Saul's head, and kissed him and said, is it not because Yahweh has anointed you commander over his inheritance? When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. 
And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. So the, the reason Saul was even coming into the area where Samuel was, was he was looking for the donkeys that had left his father's house. And he says, and now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. Then three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a skin of wine, and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. And after that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Pharisee, uh, Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you have come there to that city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Then the spirit of Yahweh will come on you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And let it be when, you, when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. So what happens? You shall surely go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you and offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So verse 9, so it was when he turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. What do you think that change was? That God gave him another heart, a heart maybe to believe that prophecy, but then what did he do? He saw everything Samuel said would happen come to pass, foretelling those events. And it says that when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him, and the Spirit of God came on him, and he prophesied among them. So Samuel prophesied, Saul would prophesy. And how was it? that he prophesied. The Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied. True prophecy is not the conjuring of ideas that come from one's own mind. It, they come from God himself sharing his mind that we would know and understand who God is and that we would hear from him the things that he wants to share uh, with us. You know, there's many examples of this throughout the Bible, but I, I just also think it's very Interesting how God used the foretelling of events to bring about some change in Peter. Remember, he said to him on the night in which he was betrayed, he said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, no way. I would never do that. I'd go to death before I would ever deny you. But we know the story that Peter did deny. He even was cursing and swearing that he didn't know Jesus by the, by the third denial. And the rooster crowed, and where did that leave Peter? The Lord knew him better than he knew him. And he went out and wept, it said. Now, it's so amazing that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, it says that all the disciples fled from him. But it also says that Peter denied him these three times. But after Jesus then was put to death and resurrected, and they're walking in the way when he was still on the earth for the 40 days. What does he say to Peter? Do you love me? And he says, yes. And then he says, feed my sheep. And he had that conversation with Peter that was so powerful in light of what Peter had done. That prophecy showed that Jesus knew his heart, even that it would sin, and that Jesus knew his love, even that he would be the one and of course, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out, who was it that spoke? It was Peter, the one who denied him three times just 53 days earlier, is now giving the sermon with confidence, no longer denying, but clearly proclaiming Christ is Lord. Jesus is the Christ who is Lord. That is the difference of the Spirit and just us in the flesh. It is not a matter of us having knowledge of the gospel. It is us receiving the spirit to really know the gospel, to not just know about Jesus, but to really know Jesus. It is a relationship that comes when we seek his face and he begins to communicate with us. And the Holy Spirit has been given to give us revelation and to give us these insights. Let's turn over now to Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 4. 
Jeremiah 25 and verse 4. Jeremiah 25 and verse 4, we're going to look at point number 5 here, which is to correct and warn. Jeremiah 25 and verse 4 says, And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to them. They said, Repent now every one of his evil way and his evil doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them, and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, and the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And when... Uh, when is the 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. All of that came to pass just as he prophesied it. All of it. He prophesied what was happening. He was prophesying warnings, and the warnings came, and the warnings came, and people would not hear God's word. Now, this is basically one of the most uh, elementary parts of prophecy. A lot of prophecy is determined either by your obedience or your disobedience to God. Leviticus 26, it's called a blessings and cursings chapter because God said, if you walk in my ways, I can bless you. If you go against my ways, there's gonna be cursing for you. Understand that we can either walk in God's ways or we can walk against it. But when we walk in a path of blessing, it gives God that opportunity to be blessing us. And when we walk in paths of disobedience, we have all kinds of opportunities to experience the cursings of not walking with God. So again, why does God call us to draw near to him? Because the only way to live life and have life abundantly with him is with his blessing, it's with his presence, and it's with obedience to him. So many prophecies come to pass because of obedience or disobedience. And fortunately, the children of Israel remain as an example to us today where God kept saying, obey my word, do my commandments, listen to me. And the people continued to reject. And because of that, they went into slavery and they went into bondage and they were taken away from their homes. So God wants us correct and warn. So as we read the scriptures, when we read what God says to do, we should take heed to his word. Jesus, or the father said through the prophet Isaiah, to whom will I look, but to him who is of a poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Let's turn over to Joel chapter two now. Joel chapter two, I'm using this verse because it came up in our uh, discipleship Bible study this week uh, as, a, as a verse of hope to, to, to those of us who have felt the loss because of cursing and because of disobedience in our lives. Notice here, uh, point number six. Kind of locked up on me back there. If you could switch to the next point there for number six for me, that would be great. So Joel chapter two, notice here in verse 25, it says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. Have you ever felt that way about your life? There's just been things that have been devoured, that it's just been taken. God says, I'm going to restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Yahweh your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am Yahweh your God. There is no other. My people shall never be put 
to shame. Isn't that beautiful that this punishment came because of disobedience? God loves to redeem. God loves to save. God loves to restore and bring back. And it says here, verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. God will be pouring out his spirit. A first fulfillment of this was in, Joel, uh, was in Acts chapter 2. And Peter quoted this in that sermon that he gave on the day of Pentecost. But this is what is to come. And God gives comfort that he will help, that he will encourage. So many places does God give this. Isaiah 41 is one of my favorites. That God says, fear not, for I am with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Let's turn over now. Uh, we'll look at the seventh one here. It's a call to action. And let's look at Joshua 6, verse 2. Joshua 6 and verse 2. So this is when they're coming to the promised land. Joshua 6 and verse 2. It says this. And the Lord, Yahweh, said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city all you men of war, you shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up. Every man straight before him. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant. Let it, the seven uh, priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said, Proceed, march. And they went. So Joshua is given a specific prophecy that Jericho is given to them, that Jericho's walls will come flat, that they will go and inhabit that city, and that basically they will take over and God didn't ask them to go pull down the walls. God didn't ask them to get out all the weapons and, and do bombardments against that stronghold. What he asked them to do was march and blow the trumpets. Sometimes that's the way it is. Second Chronicles 20 is another great example where a prophet told them, you don't have to worry about this. The battle is the Lord's. And so he said, you're going to go out, but you're not going to have to fight but you are going to go out. And when they went out, what did they go out doing? Second Chronicles 20, they went out praising him. They went out worshiping God. And it says that when God heard them begin to sing and praise him, he set ambushes and he brought against the people of Mount Seir and Ammon. They, they fought uh, in the third country. They fought against themselves. There was no need for them to fight. God turned the enemy on themselves. That's who your God is. But what did he Love and desire, the obedience to go out to the battle and to let God do the battle. What did he desire in Jericho? To go out to the walls, but let God do the battles at the walls. So sometimes the prophecy is just this. It's a call to action. Let's turn to uh, Isaiah 8, and we'll finish up here. In Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah chapter 8, we're going to pick it up here in verse 11. Isaiah 8 and verse 11. The Lord Yahweh spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. My encouragement to you today is to not walk in the way of this people. The people of the world are driven by their own pleasure, by their own desires, by the things that they believe will make them happy that are apart from God. And it's built upon ego and pride. And it's built upon sustaining life for the self without giving it up for God. I encourage you to not walk in that way. I encourage you to reject that way. That we should walk in the way of the Lord and not in the way of this people. And notice what he says. Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call 
a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Have you ever noticed how much of life has become about that? It's almost crazy, the insanity of how many times we're told to be afraid of something and of this happening and what it's leading to and how it's going to... There's all sorts of prophecies and forms of the conspiracy being laid out to us, but it's all worldly. It's of people's own imaginations and their own thoughts. I mean, look at how much has been going on just in the last 10 years with conspiracies and how many of these conspiracies and the things that people talk about actually come to pass. And as soon as that happens, you know what they do? They prophesy another conspiracy. And when that doesn't happen, they prophesy another conspiracy. And when that doesn't happen, it's another one. It's falsehood after falsehood after falsehood. And you and I should be checking to just say, that's it. If somebody says they have a prophecy and prophesy, especially if they give you a timing and a date, woo I don't know if it's true or not, but I guess we're going to find out. You can listen to the prophecy. It doesn't mean you have to build your whole life around it. How many were here in Y2K? Do you remember that? Like, it feels forever ago. How many of the prophecies, the conspiracies of the world came to pass about Y2K? None. It was zero. I know people that literally cashed out accounts, retirement accounts, built bunkers under their house, on their property, filled it with food, all kinds of storage, and when 2000 came, nothing happened. Do you know what happened? Oh, we got to wait till 2001 when it clicks into the next year. And that person waited a whole nother year for the conspiracies and all the false prophecies that the world threw out to be true. And all the fear that created building bunkers and having safe places came to naught. Now, I want you to listen to a better way because the world's way is to scare you and the world's way is to get you thinking about the government and all the conspiracies and the things that go on. My friends, the things of the world are child's play compared to the will and power of Almighty God, and his ways are so superior in every way because what he wants to turn, he turns. What he wants to bless, he blesses. What he wants to curse, he curses. There's no one and nothing in this world that can stop God from being God. Our role is to see God without having seen him with our eyes, to believe in him and trust in him, and we do that by putting everything through the test of his word and where our attention is lying. So, uh, or not lying, but resting in, I mean. So notice what it says. Do not, do not say a conspiracy. This is verse 12. Concerning all this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Yahweh of hosts, him you shall hallow. If you want to be afraid of something, be afraid of going against God. That is a worthy fear. Fear the Lord, trust in him, acknowledge and revere him as your God. Him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary. Do you hear that? He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken away. Why? Because they're not looking to God, they're looking to the conspiracies and the prophecies of this world that bring with it all kinds of darkness and all kinds of despondency and all kinds of negativity. And if you just look at the way our own society here is in the United States, all of these conspiracies, are they bringing about edification or are they bringing about internal, emotional, and spiritual destruction? Because that's what I'm witnessing. Two ways, the world's way or God's way. So what does he say in verse 16? Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait on the Lord, Yahweh, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom Yahweh has given me, for we are signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Those who believe those who trust, those who dwell with him. Verse 19, and when they, that is the people of the world, say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Notice verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, 
If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Very clear litmus test. Is this the filter for everything? It should be. For every prophecy, for everything. Does it hold the test? And sometimes you don't know if it holds the test. You can just hold a person's prophecy in your heart and say, well, that person during COVID, he said that all this would come to pass. He had people testify that his prophecies were true. He prophesied that the Chinese would be marching in the streets of the United States by December. It never happened. Unless you guys saw it, I didn't. I missed that. And I'm saying that's the kind of thing you need to say and let's recognize false prophecies are happening around us all the time, but we get suckered into the next one, it seems like, so easily. We don't need to. God's already given us plenty of prophecy to focus on, plenty of things, and he's told us to seek prophecy that we would understand his will and his ways. Verse 21, he says, after he says, if they don't speak according to the law and testimony, they do not speak according to this word. This is verse 20. It is because there is no light in them. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward, and then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Friends, walk in the light as Christ is in the light. Seek a relationship with God. Seek to hear from him. Worship him. Praise him. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. This is the attitude in which the culture and the relationship with God happens that brings about his grace, that brings about a spirit of prophecy, that brings about the gifts and the manifestation of his spirit and of his grace in your life. Seek God. Don't settle for the things of this world. Seek his grace and his glory. Let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge that you are the God of all good, of all things right and just. We just ask your blessing now that you would take the words we have heard this day, that you would help us to meditate on them, and that you would correct us by them and help us to walk in your ways that we would forsake the world, and that we would pursue you with all of our being, that we would not be left out of your counsel, but that we would spend the days in your court. Your son, Jesus, gave his life and brought his own blood into the most holy place to pave the way that we could always be there with you. Let us not take this gift for granted. Let us remember what you have told us, and let us enter into your holy courts often. God, for all we desire is to hear your judgments, your thoughts, to know your ways, that we might walk with you and be united with you in thought, in word, and in deed forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.